morning to all the participants. Thanks for taking the time out to join this earnings call. Uh, like the format we presented in the past, uh, we will take you through a presentation. And then uh, maybe in about 20, 25 minutes, we would be done. And then we should have enough time for Q&A. Uh, overall, as all of you know, uh, FY22 has been a strong year uh, compared to the, uh, I would say, reasonably uh, lean performance that we saw in FY21. Uh, FY22 was a strong year across all key metrics, whether you see financial or operating metrics, uh, investor interest in mutual funds, our product launches, our digital properties, etc. So we will uh, kind of cover all of these aspects in the presentation, and I will begin. Uh, in terms of key highlights, uh, the first one that I would like to mention is that uh, Zeroda, as a potential asset manager, which is about to join the marketplace, has uh, opted to go with CAM. Some of you may have noticed this. In the exchange filing we made about a week or 10 days back, we haven't yet done an official press release. But uh, just in terms of the future outlook, although it does take a new AMC a lot of time to build business, uh, that's a very positive outcome for CAMS. The second is that uh, we had announced to you earlier, and you would have seen it in the press, that in order to strengthen our overall position in the alternatives market, uh, where we anyways have a very strong play going, uh, we made a strategic acquisition in a fintech platform called Fintuple which services uh, both PMS and uh, <coughs> AIF operators. Uh, that has now got concluded uh, in the month of April and cancels authority uh, in this company and in this platform. On account aggregator, the CAMS FinServe account aggregator uh, platform went live in 4Q of the year with two clients. Uh, we've had 10 new wins in the fourth quarter. These are largely in the area of uh, brokerages, housing finance, fintechs, NBFCs, and banks. Uh, one medium-sized bank has chosen to join our platform. Uh, volumes uh, are scaling up, not very rapidly. Some of the largest banks haven't yet joined in. Uh, there's been some delay there. But the very heartening piece of news is that uh, SEBI has now officially confirmed that uh, SEBI governed entities will be joining the account aggregate architecture. Uh, that will happen in the coming months. So that broadens out the play from uh, lending entities to capital market entities. <clears throat> and then, of course, our expectation is that both insurance and pension will follow uh, just to uh, complete that entire story. We've spoken about our NPS platform. I'm sure a lot of you would have joined the <clears throat> launch ceremony uh, of the platform, which was inaugurated by the PFRDA chairman. Uh, very pleased to share with you that uh, the ENPS product, which is a direct-to-consumer uh, electronic product bought directly, not off the payroll, uh, went live sometime in March. In the month of April, and I'm just talking of the first completed month, uh, we are in the first week of May right now, we achieved the over 4% share. These are very early days, uh, shares, uh, absolute volumes, et cetera, will start making sense once you've delivered all of this for the first maybe four or five months. But just from a uh, just from a perspective of uh, something which has gone live recently, uh, we now have 4% share in ENPS registrations and the number two CRA position only in ENPS. The government and pop business has yet to uh, start acquiring. Uh, the POP business hopefully will start acquiring consumers uh, by the end of this month, beginning of next. But in the ENPS part, <laughs> we've seen a strong start. You would have read uh, CAMS Reps, uh, new algo, uh, new product variant, on uh, deep level contact tracing by trawling uh, large amounts of investor data, including social media presence, et cetera, to trace the untraceable policy holders who are due for receiving uh, policy benefits but haven't got them yet. Uh, unclaimed amounts continue to be a problem that every sector of the financial services industry is dealing with, insurance especially, because that is the only reason why people buy insurance. Uh, five large private sector life insurers have now joined uh, and have subscribed to the solution, and we are expecting more to come in 
uh, this is overall a creative to the business <coughs> and uh, we are very hopeful that uh, you know this very deeply intellectually imbued algorithmic way of doing tracing of customers who are otherwise not available uh, will create uh, ripples in the market and interest in the consumers and then on camp pay uh, we launched upi order pay and instant match it is an industry first from a mutual fund industry perspective mutual fund industry did not have these products they have now gone live and showing uh, very strong early results so in summary those were the five or six things that i wanted to call out uh, across our various business lines as we dive deeper uh, i will leave you with some data and this data is about uh, various segments of the mutual fund market how we've done in terms of uh, share of assets and share of sales i mean if you condense this entire picture it is about absolute uh, asset momentum and growth in share it's about absolute sales momentum and growth in share and we will talk about these uh, as much about the equity segment and then overall uh, equity share growth which is equity aum uh, we grew by 3.7 lakh crores and just an unprecedented number which we hadn't seen in previous years <coughs> uh this was the total lakh crore is actually the growth of equity assets from march of 21 to march of 22 uh, if you take the rest of the market this is about uh, 183% of the overall uh, rest of the market uh, the 3.3 lakh crore number the rest of the market grew by about 1.8 lakh crore uh our share in industry equity assets so you you've seen our 70% market share which is obviously different uh, asset classes has been different in equity assets this share has crept up 62.5% in march 21 to 65% in march 22 so that's about a 2.5% share gain in just pure equity assets during this time period if i take you to gross sales gross sales and net sales are both important gross sales i think uh, represent the most primary metric than net sales because net sales balance out people who are existing this is about people who are coming in uh, in equity 64% share in gross sales uh, 4.29 crore uh, with the rest of the industry doing 2.4 and in debt this share was 77% so 77% of all debt uh, gross sales uh, came to camp service fund which is 6.19 lakh crore uh, and 1.84 lakh crore done by the rest of the industry all numbers are in lakh crore uh, as far as aum numbers are concerned uh, if we club everything together we take overall gross sales merging all the segments uh, 70% share uh, camps did 66 lakh crore of gross sales the rest of the industry did 28 lakh crore and this in, uh, equity includes uh, hybrid and arbitrage these are standard definitions uh, standard after definitions uh, and sub definitions which play out here on the uh, nfo side which you know was again uh, after a hiatus uh, very strong momentum creating set of events in the industry played out almost throughout the year played out very intensely in august to december and then to some extent uh, in in jan to march and of course uh, there is a there is a small time period for which there will be no nfos uh, overall camp industry did over 52000 crore so at 70% share the rest of the industry did about 22000 crore uh, across asset classes so overall uh, 70% uh, in the equity nfo inflows and in overall uh, inflows uh, for nfo the share was 65% so whether you see overall gross sales you see share of the equity assets expanding from 62.5 to 65 if you see overall gross sales at 70% share if you see equity nfo inflows 70% share if you take overall uh, uh, nfo inflows that was 65% uh, where are we as a client base what are the clients doing uh, top 5 amcs by aum uh, constitute the client account client in as of the quarter end 10 of the top 15 amcs constitute our uh, client in and then interestingly uh, four of the top five amcs based on equity assets too so we've discussed equity uh, market share in various forums just wanted to be sure that some of that flavor on the share side on uh, industry rankings purely on equity 
head on the NFO connections comes out because that kind of uh, rounds up the entire story. <coughs> on transactions, uh, which you know, as participation increases, transaction counts increase in the industry. Just tracing through uh, first quarter of the year to fourth quarter, he rose to a historic high of 115 million transactions, so 11 and a half crore. This was 11 crore in the previous quarter, October, November, December. Was just over 10 crore in the quarter before that, which is second quarter of the year, July, August, September. And was 8.75 crore in the quarter before that. So you can consistently see, and you're aware that a lot of this is just uh, SIP participation, is uh, SIP market share and SIP volumes, uh, all of which have gone through a very robust kicker in the last uh, six to eight months. So that's largely contributed one Q total transactions at 8.75 lakh, uh, 8.75 crore, and then 11.5 in the fourth quarter. So within the year, transaction volume has gone up by almost uh, three crore, 2.75 crore, which is, again, I don't recollect when the numbers looked uh, so strong and so positive. Uh, on SIP registrations, and uh, you have seen that SIP registrations have become a, I would say, a more secular, a more steady foundational metric than something which reacts to uh, every income cycle, every interest rate cycle, every change in the marketplace. Uh, those numbers have been uh, very, very heartening. Uh, CAMP's new SIP registrations in FI21 with just under 73 lakh. That has grown to 158 lakh. So that number has more than doubled from FI21 to FI22. Overall, if you see, 72.9 was a 52% share of the SIP registration market in FI21. And the 158 in FI22 is a 59% share. So a 7% gain in share. 52 to 59 percent, and more than doubling of the volumes. Uh, despite us having created a number of utilities where investors can stop, pause their SIPs and do various other things, uh, the only one metric that you need to look at to see how steady the SIP collections market has been is to watch the SIP collections themselves, because there's no net of gross number there, because that's just money which uh, comes out of investor bank. And you've been seeing almost a four to five crore increment at industry level uh, in the last uh, maybe three to four months. So those are stable uh, on-ground foundational metrics, uh, which I said uh, do not react to uh, every change in marketplace and marketplace dynamics, which is good for the industry because that is a long-term decision of saving an investment which the investor has taken. And he knows that seasonality is a part of uh, this entire movement. Let's move forward. Moving to digital, I think a fantastic story in digital. Uh, I'll talk about MyCamps first, which continues to remain the largest mobile app in the mutual fund arena in the country with 5 million registered users. Uh, significant uptake in new people registering onto MyCamps. So 11 lakh new investors were added to MyCamps, 26% uh, more than FI21. Uh, so you can see that almost 20% of the 5 million, <coughs> a little more than that, 25% investors came only in one financial year. If you took the sigma of all digital transactions across camp service funds, and then saw the fraction of my camp, that's one third, one out of three digital transactions of camp service funds is uh, coming from my camp, which is uh, very heartening. On MS Central, which uh, was built and put out in the market by camps and the other RTA, uh, again, a uh, strong uh, journey forward. The mobile app version was launched and I've seen over 40,000 downloads. Uh, the app is rated strongly over four in both the Play Store and the App Store. Close to two lakh uh, investor registrations, almost two lakh non-financial transactions, just short of uh, one lakh cash downloads, and average login so over 7,000, almost 7,500 a day. Uh, obviously, for a platform of this nature, uh, we are expecting the login sessions will be several X times, will be 5 to 10 X of this number over a period of time. 
But given the fact that we've been in the market the last three or four months, uh, that, that, that's very heartening. Financial transactions for investors will go live uh, in the current quarter. Uh, just go back to this. Overall, uh, CAMS digital properties uh, service an aggregate AUM of uh, just short of 8 lakh crores. So if you took the, the entire picture, uh, if I took approximately the aggregate AUM of 27 lakh crores, 8 lakh crore comes uh, under the purview of CAMS digital properties, which is almost 30%, which is just a vindication of the increasing uh, penetration of uh, digital usage amongst consumers. And the, and the steady relevance and share gain of cap digital properties so within that segment. I think it just mitigates those two things. The other thing that I want to talk to you about and which, you know, we've spoken often in both individual investor meetings, group meetings, and in uh, earnings calls is uh, the behavior of the alternatives markets, especially EIS. Uh, in the last uh, quarter or two, we've uh, cemented our position in this market as the domestic EIF services market leader. And I'm talking about hard metrics, and I'll tell you uh, what hard and soft metrics are, but overall assets under administration of 1.4 lakh crore. Uh, we don't run like I've said to many of you, only stamp duty, only marginal service mandates. These are full service mandates. 15 new sustained wins. Uh, in the last quarter, in 4Q or 522. Uh, given the fact you know that uh, while there are upwards of 800 AIF and PMS uh, operations, uh, the unique operators are perhaps uh, under 300, which is that one entity could have uh, multiple schemes. Uh, we continue to penetrate uh, this market and make uh, uh, strong wins. On the digital onboarding side, <laughs> which is a product we put out in the market in August, so it's been live for the last seven to eight months, over 30 funds have signed up for EIF and PMS digital onboarding with either CAMS or with Fit uh, We are aggressively wanting to scale this number uh, to get to, let's say, 100 within the next 12 months. Uh, we also see that almost half the funds which are signing up for digital haven't yet signed up with us on the RTA services side, which is a very heartening route to market. We've opened a new route to this market, which means entities which are still not completely bought in on outsourcing of the RTA component are already coming in for the digital and creates a strong scope for us to win the uh, other scope as it comes in. On gift service, the office is operational, like we said in the last uh, call, live with four clients, uh, more and more expression of interest continues to come in from the market. And then, like I said, we deepened our digital footprint in the AI ecosystem with a 51% stake in digital technologies. Uh, I spoke about account aggregator. We spoke about the fact that uh, we've had 10 new wins. Uh, two uh, clients are now live, and increasingly clients are going live in this market. The, the semi-governed entities will now begin to show interest as officially the endorsement from the regulators come. So we expect uh, that part to move uh, quickly during the balance part of the current uh, year and current financial year. And then I spoke about uh, NPS and ENPS of having scored a 4% share in the ENPS market uh, during the last month, uh, just a month before. In terms of share, I think all these numbers are known to you, so I will go uh, Sorry, um, Mr. Anish Kumar, we're not able to hear you, sir. Are you sorry. still connected? Okay. Yeah, I'm connected. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So uh, on, the, on the market share, etc., uh, you know the numbers, but I will quickly take you through these, especially for 4Q, uh, based on quarterly AUM, 69% market share. Uh, net flows into equity assets, uh, despite some of the overhangs that we've seen in the overall marketplace in capital markets, both in India and globally, uh, those uh, those inflows remain negative, uh, remain positive in 4Q of FI22. Inflows through SIP, this is just the monthly SIP collection, for the quarter were up 7.2% uh, quarter and quarter. 
uh, in terms of absolute numbers, uh, 26.7 lakh crore was the quarter average assets serviced by camps, within which equity was 11 lakh crore. Uh, like you know, uh, this grew, overall assets grew almost 20% year on year, and equity grew over 40%. Uh, within this, uh, of the 26.7, when I just suppose it with the industry assets, that's 38.8 lakh crore. Uh, industry equity is 17.2. Uh, we are 11 out of that. Move forward. In terms of transaction volumes, like I said, they grew from about uh, 8.75 crore to 11.5. So that's quarter and quarter 4% up, but a very strong 34% increase year on year. Uh, live investor folios for the quarter touched uh, 51.6 million, so 5.16 crore, up 38% year on year. We are a very steady growth. IP book uh, has almost touched 3 crore, just uh, a lakh or two short of that, so at 29.9 million, uh, up 39% year on year. Uh, unique investor service were 2.29 crore, 22.9 million, again 38% increase in year on year. And SIP transactions, which uh, kind of form the bedrock of the overall transaction counts at 87.5 million, 8.75 crore, uh, up 42 percent year on year. So that's largely the story on uh, transaction counts, digital, sales market share, NFO market share, asset market share, SIP collections, those kind of things. Like I said, the 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 overhang of uh, press rates. Uh, incidents around global peace or lack of peace, uh, inflation, etc., continue to be uh, what they are. And you've heard uh, enough industry experts speak about that. We are not going into those aspects in detail. But the impression I want to leave with you is that in terms of foundational building blocks, which is investors coming in, investors reposing their faith, uh, coming in for monthly formats of uh, savings and investment, coming through SIP, transacting with us, monitoring the portfolios, adding monies. Uh, all of those trends have largely remained intact, especially between 3Q to 4Q, so we're not seeing any impact yet. And uh, that is the positive underpinning of the entire marketplace. And of course, the fact that despite the overhang, uh, overall assets and equity assets, have continued to remain stable in the market. I'll pause here and hand over to Ram Chiran to take us through the financials. Thank you, Anuj. Uh, um, I'll just take you through the yearly financial highlights of, of for FI22 and uh, some flavor on the quarter that went by. As Anuj mentioned, uh, FI22 was a very strong year for CAMS in terms of uh, financials. Uh, the AUM uh, that we track, which is uh, the average AUM, grew by 27.6% in the year. Uh, um, that is FI21 versus FI22. So our revenue kind of tracked this, and uh, revenue grew by around 30, 29%. This, it, went, it ended at 909.7 crores, up 29% over 705 crores, which we clocked in the earlier year. Out of this, the MF revenue, again, uh, almost tracked the entire growth in AUM, um, which is, uh, it grew by 28.8%. Uh, the AEM grew by 28%, so it almost tracked the entire growth of uh, AEM. Uh, the MS for revenue was at 820 crores versus 636 crores the earlier year. In which uh, the asset-based revenue, again healthy growth, uh, tracking the AEM growth, uh, a, a asset-based revenue grew by 27% year on year uh, for the financial year. It ended at 690 crores versus 542 crores for the earlier year. Uh, so the strong growth in AEM is reflected entirely in the growth in asset-based revenue. The non-asset based revenue, which is uh, transaction, uh, transaction based revenue, which is out of pocket expenses, call center revenue, etc. That also had a healthy growth of 38.6% uh, and it was at 130 crores for the year as opposed to 94 crores for the earlier year. The non-MF revenue uh, uh, did a smart recovery when compared to last year. Uh, non-MF revenue, if uh, you will recollect, consists of the AAF business the CAMS pay business, uh, the KRA, and the insurance repository business, and some amount of the software services that we do to our mutual fund clients. So that grew almost 30% uh, year on year. Uh, it ended up around 90 crores, 89.6 crores to be precise, as opposed to 68 crores. So overall, uh, a very healthy growth in the top line across all categories uh, in MF, that is asset, non-SFDS, as well as non-MF. 
Uh, from a profitability perspective, uh, we ended up with a very strong uh, operating EBITDA of 400 crores, 400.39 to be precise, uh, which was actually a 47% growth in EBITDA over the last year. Uh, last year, uh, the EBITDA FI21 was 272 crores, and the operating EBITDA percentage, uh, if you don't consider leases capitalization, is around 44%. Uh, this again uh, uh, is, a, is a very uh, is a very large growth when compared to last year, tracking the growth in revenue and the cost optimization that has happened. In terms of PBT, uh, we entered the year with 382.65 crores, which is up almost 40% over the last year. Last year number was 274 crores, and PAT uh, it was up uh, almost 40%. Uh, again, 286 crores was the PAT for the FI22, as opposed to 205 crores for the last year. So the profitability, again, strong numbers, backed by increase in top line as well as cost uh, arbitrage in some of the uh, heads. So we ended up with a high uh, net profit margin of 31 percentage, uh, and the last year the percentage was 28 percent. So improvement in profitability metrics also for the financial year. Just to give you some flavor of the Q4 numbers in terms of revenue, uh, we ended Q4 with a revenue of 243 crores, 243.18 which was up 21.7% year-on-year, the same quarter of FI21. Uh, this actually breaks down into uh, an MF revenue of 217 crores, uh, which was again up 20.6% year-on-year. Uh, and uh, an asset-based revenue was uh, at 152 crores, uh, sorry, 181 crores, which was up 19% year-on-year. Again, the, the asset-based revenue growth tracks the increase in AEM, which was up around 19.6%. The asset-based revenue was up 19%. Similarly, from a non-asset-based revenue, uh, it was up almost 30% year-on-year on the back of uh, improvement in transaction revenue as well as call central and other applications. Uh, this ended at 36 crores uh, as opposed to 28 crores in the last year. And in terms of non-MF revenue, uh, the quarter, uh, we clocked a revenue of around 25.54 crores. Again, it was up around 32% over last year. Uh, growth across all verticals, including AIF, uh, CAMS pay, CAMS rep, uh, contributing to this 32% increase in growth. In terms of quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth, uh, uh, there was a small, uh, as the AEM actually remained flat on quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, so the AEM, uh, the MF revenue growth was also muted. It was uh, uh, marginal. And the, but the non-MF revenue actually grew substantially quarter-on-quarter -quarter to 15% almost. Uh, so that was at 25 crores as opposed to 22 crores the last year. So this resulted in an overall uh, small increase, marginal increase in the revenue. Uh, and the EBITDA, uh, given that we continue to invest in our new initiatives uh, with regard to uh, a, a, the CRA business that Anu spoke about, the account aggregator business, the TSP business, uh, the investments we continue to make. So there was a small decline sequentially on the EBITDA margins uh, and the EBITDA number by 1.5 crores from operating perspective. Uh, uh, this is a flavor of the uh, revenue and the profitability for the quarter. I'll just hand it back for more questions that you may have. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who has a question may press star and one. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We'll take the first question from the line of Devesh Agarwal from IFL Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, sir, and congratulations on good set of numbers. Uh, firstly, I wanted to understand on the quarterly uh, mutual fund revenues. Uh, if I divide that with the assets that you service, uh, there has been an improvement uh, in the yields on a sequential basis. Uh, could you explain that? Because uh, the assets are more or less similar, and so is the equity share. So, uh, Devesh, uh, actually, uh, there is one important change that happened to the statement that you're making, which is that the equity mix has improved marginally. If you see, compared to last time, it's almost like a percentage, a percentage up in terms of the equity assets uh, overall. So that is that is a beneficial impact. And even within that, uh, you know, there are some 
uh, inter customer movements that happened in the last for example every customer actually did not grow so there were some customers who grew in that so that was a favorable impact of that too so both put together that is you are right uh, you know the eeis have inched up marginally in the quarter which is again uh, validation of what we have been speaking earlier we have always been saying that if the assets remain stable or degrow uh, you know the eeis depletion will not happen it will be stable or there will be a marginal increase i think the numbers for the current quarter kind of seem to validate uh, our commentary on that earlier all right sir uh, secondly sir on your non asset based mutual fund revenues uh, could you highlight how much comes from the transaction and uh, what is the, what would be share of the transaction in that uh, non asset based revenues so the transaction revenue will be uh, between 25 to 30 percent depending on the quarter devesh uh, that will be the percentage of the non asset based remaining will be call center and we have some license fee that we do for example our msdx application our uh, our front office applications and all those things we kind of get some license fee for that and then there is the op so the major part is the transaction based which is be called between 25 and 30 percent all right and uh, again on the non mutual fund revenue we see an inch up uh, this quarter uh, almost a percent Uh, again uh, what has driven that and uh, going ahead uh, what would be your uh, guidance in terms of the contribution from the non mutual fund business given that now uh, both uh, aa and uh, nps have gone live uh, that's right uh, the non mutual fund uh, business has uh, kind of grown well in the uh, sequential quarter as well as uh, year on year uh, aa as anuj was mentioning earlier is a, is a is a is on a good growth trajectory so it has kind of come up almost like uh, 35% year on year and even on a sequential basis uh, it's kind of up almost 7 8% so that's kind of done well across the board they are camps based business uh, as you saw new offerings are coming in they have started uh, kind of some traction on that uh, they have again improved around uh, 11% quarter on quarter uh, similar for our uh, kra business insurance repository during the last quarter we did see some small uptick in the policy conversions also so that kind of did go up around uh, 15 uh, 15 17% so we have seen across the board increase in the last quarter in the non mutual fund business on on uh, the second part of the business uh, second part of the question that you asked on specifically on a and this i will probably let anuj answer that so there is like uh, ramcharan said uh, non mutual fund almost all cylinders were firing uh, aif camps pay kra and insurance right now <clears throat> there is uh, i would say very marginal negligible contribution from a and NPS, NPS, like I told you, uh, was the first, the very first completed month of operation. Whatever impact they have, we will see it from this quarter. But we are expecting real impact of that to come, uh, any real impact to come in the second half of the year. So that thing hasn't played out yet. That will play out. It is the other four components which have contributed to the non-mutual fund revenue. Mm-hmm. Does that answer your question? it looks like the participant connection has dropped out in the meanwhile uh, we'll move to our next question we, before we do that we'd like to remind participants if you wish to ask a question you may enter star and 1 the next question is from the line of puneet kumar from reliable investments please go ahead mr anuj thanks for the excellent presentation that you always do number 2 the numbers were good it needs a congratulation thank you from all of us last you need to take care of your throat which doesn't seem to be in the best possible shape so mr ramcharan you can answer two and a half questions that i'm going to ask uh number one if you see this quarter which is march quarter over last year it has grown by 21.3% whereas the december quarter had grown by 25.7% this is year on year does that mean that we are slipping number two There's a lot of things happening in terms of the parent company pledging, company parent company selling. What is Deutsche Bank doing into it? We took the loan from uh, which bank? All those kinds of confusions are not getting reflected well in the market. I think so. And the last question, small one is: Are we compromising on the auditor name in terms of quality? Thank you so much. uh so please thanks thanks for your comments uh i will answer this in part and then i'll ask uh, rachan to take over uh see the the release that you saw is a is a very routine uh, kind of occurrence 
that utterance is uh, and i'll give you the details private equity companies when they hold an investment uh, hold it in an entity the owner of that entity is typically their investors or lps it is possible to have some loan in that entity which means you made a 100 rupee investment 90 rupees came from the investors 10 rupees came from a banker to total the 100 through which the investment is made so whatever you are seeing and the filing that you've seen is about banker a who had lent that 10 rupees now moving away and banker b coming in this is at the investor level this is not camps pledging anything or any of the domestic shareholders pledging anything this is at the level of a uh, one level up investor switching that small amount of loan from banker a to banker b all these loans are backed by <clears throat> pledges of shares so we are sure that uh, there is some pledge happening there but this is not at company level at all so that is one thing that we are letting you know the standard accepted process in the market as you know is to declare these events to which is how you saw the filing so that's the answer to your question if you want a separate conversation we have to have a separate conversation don't treat it as anything outside the routine switching of a lender by somebody who borrowed money uh, that's all that it is Uh, and the pledge is a standard pledge i will hand back to ranchar to comment upon 3q and 4q and if anything is left so also uh, you are right in terms of a growth uh, what we did year on year in q3 to q4 uh, is a little lesser but uh, you know uh, it also tracks the aem growth if you actually saw the aem growth in q3 was around 28% and hence the revenue growth tracked that right? why year on year uh, revenue growth for the current year is uh, is again 20 22 23% our revenue growth is tracking that so it's a function of the aem growth that happened in the industry in q3 versus q4 this is in fact uh, if anything have uh, remained stable or become a little better so this is not a sign of any any depletion in any of our offerings or revenue potential or anything if you see from a longer term perspective our cagr continues to be the same if you actually see the year end and see the 3 year cagr 5 year cagr and 10 year cagr the 5 year and 10 year cagr continues to be a healthy the industry continues to be around 19.8 20% and our camps revenue grew, continues to grow in fact little higher than our, our last calculation almost like 16% so uh, this is kind of a longer term trend that will pay out quarter on quarter that could be fluctuations in the asset growth and our revenue uh, since we are 89 90% based on mf asset growth uh, our revenue will track that uh, small uh, small movement or uh, fluctuations quarter on quarter but this is not a reflection of the long term any depletion that's happened in our potential okay. We'll take a next question from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. And just a few questions from my side. So on the first one, you know, if you can break up your uh, non-asset linked MF revenues. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, into... sorry to interrupt. Could you just hold your phone or microphone closer to you? We can't hear you that well. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, thank you. Sure. So on the first part, I just wanted to understand how much of your non-asset linked MF uh, revenues during the year. uh was led by higher nfo related volumes that we witnessed uh, in fy 2022 so uh for the year uh, I, it's not a significant percentage it's a single digit percentage because the revenue model for nfos is uh, is the applications based billing so although there were mega mega nfos and there will be some revenue that comes from nfos uh, depending on the way we look at it it's more kind of a future revenue potential for the nfos rather than the one time revenue that we get by processing the application form so that's that that will be less than uh, uh, less than 5 and gross for the year that's not going to be significant the potential that gives us for future revenue is what is more appetizing in that on the on the second question so uh, you know now that you have gone live with the a uh, proposition and it has kicked off if you can share some unit economics more on the non psp side of the business uh, in terms of uh, how your revenue model is structured and the margins that you probably intend to make on more of a steady state basis in the business 
Okay. Uh, see, uh, as you know, there are two components to this. One is the account aggregator and another is the TSP. Uh, so the A, uh, yes, we are seeing traction and we are seeing use cases also evolve. A couple of them uh, regarding the lending use case as well as the broker onboarding uh, is kind of a little more crystallized now than what it was earlier, but still is early days. See, the, the revenue model for this is a one-time implementation cost. Uh, where we, especially in the TSP model, where we kind of enable uh, the end customers, SIP and SIU, to actually have an encryption and decryption layer, and some uh, over, over and above that, there is some analytics that we will do for them. That's the imp one-time implementation cost that we will charge, and the predominant revenue will come from for EA as well as TSP will be a per pool cost. So, uh, you know, in terms of the one data that passes through our pipe, uh, first to the TSP layer, and then the AA layer, and the TSP layer, and to the FI, FIU, so that actually constitutes one pool which will be built one by the TSP and one by the AA. Uh, it's too early to predict on what the margins will be. What we are sure is that it's a wide market, it's a large market, new cases are evolving, and it's going to be a volume-based market. It's not going to be a niche market uh, for sure. So uh, the prices are settling down. As you would know in, an in, in the initial part of it, there will be some competition on prices. So we are still at the stage where there is some discovery happening on what is the appropriate price. Uh, but uh, our models are clear. We think that in the medium and long term, this will be a profitable business for us. Sure. Uh, on the, uh, just two more questions from my side. One is uh, on the offshore fund servicing that you have started through the Gig City. Uh, you know, uh, what are the services you are providing? And if you can shed some color on, you know, uh, your, pro your proposition or plans for that business um, segment going ahead. Yeah, sure. So if you see, uh, I'm sure you are aware of the Gig City, and uh, how the overall architecture is being promoted, uh, largely for uh, domestic deployment. So think of a domestic fund which is going to invest in domestic assets, but is planning to raise money overseas. Uh, the options for fund administration were largely outside India. Uh, the arbitrage which is getting created is uh, with a strong push uh, of the government and the regulators. Can a lot of that offshore administration come into India? You know that a lot of that administration sits in Mauritius, Singapore, etc. I guess most of the participants on this call belong to a fund house or two and know how that architecture works. So as that arbitrage plays out, as the, I would say, the, the incentivization of participants to operate out of India goes up, uh, we will see momentum in new funds uh, filing for permission with SEBI and then taking up offices. In fact, I was uh, with one of our domestic clients yesterday, and they've just leased space uh, 10 days back because um, and applied for permission. I would still not say that there is, uh, there is earth-shattering momentum yet. Uh, Gift City has been around for a few years. Uh, the momentum is building up. But with the incentivization, it is possible that a lot of overseas fund raised with deployment in India, that architecture will start playing out uh, in in Gift City, and that is the way this, this market will develop. So like we said, we've had about four sign-ups, about one a month. We are expecting that at momentum, we should be perhaps getting a signing a week, but there is some time for that to happen. Sure. Uh, last question from my side. Uh, so, firstly, congratulations on you know our new deal win during the quarter. I just want to understand when you when you pitch to a new client um, who has not yet start, commenced uh, MS business, uh, how how do you determine the pricing model? You know, what does the pitch really uh, constitute, bearing the propositions and service offerings that obviously you know will be a part of the pitch? For sure. So today, if you see, uh, the RTA service stack is a very, very broad stack, and sometimes I have publicly said that calling ourselves just registrars is perhaps a misnomer and is, uh, condenses uh, you know, the scope that we perform. So overall, what a consumer looks for and what we pitch is essentially our capability to do record keeping, investor servicing, execution of uh, investor trades, uh, payments, settlements, uh, all of that kind of work. Uh, the regulatory adherence, uh, the compliance, uh, cyber security, ability to, you know, deliver gold standards in uptime, uh, BCP as an integral part of our overall architecture, our digital assets, our front office spread. I think there are 10 to 15 core components uh, that play out. And while I don't want to take you to any one of these, I'll just give you an example that when a new fund house comes in and looks at my camps, 
and see that there are 50 lakh investors to whom they can potentially pitch. We obviously don't allow advertising or marketing on my camps. It's just a transaction platform. But you can make yourself visible to 50 lakh consumers. Uh, there is no other place uh, which can allow you that. Similarly, you can make yourself visible uh, to walk-ins in 280 uh, branch offices across the country. Uh, there is no other place where you can do that easily. And similarly, our track record of managing fund houses which have assets of several lakh crore, but at the other hand, also fund houses which have only two or three thousand crore, right? I mean, we have the entire spectrum. And the amount of attention uh, CAMS is able to pay to, to kind of introduce finesse in their overall execution. Our best in class cybersecurity scores, which you've seen in many of our presentation decks, a very, very strong capability in managing business in any of our three centers if there was a uh, geopolitical or any other weather-related crisis in one of the cities. I think, invest, uh, I think consumers look at each one of these components. But more than that, more than the, the uh, formal presentations, I think they look at a uh, lot of market feedback. They talk to our consumers. They talk to uh, many other parts of the ecosystem to form a belief in uh, our capabilities. But that's how business has grown over the last many decades. It's just not an occurrence of today. But like I said, there are you know 10 to 15 very strong core themes, including our leadership team, uh, very strong winter leadership team. Uh, which help to position in front of a new client. That plays out identically in the capital markets, very intense in uh, AMC sales, but also equally intense in AIF sales. Sure. Uh, thanks for the detailed explanation and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Sanjay Vastramani from Envision Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So can you highlight uh, which can be your core competitors in the market? So uh, depending upon which product you're looking for, the competitors change. If I look at the core business, uh, which is the RTA business, there is one large licensed RTA, you know the name. Uh, they are competitors. Uh, when it comes to a lot of other capabilities, our ability to, for example, offer APIs of all kinds, uh, you know, have uh, websites, transaction portals, etc. built. Uh, there are a lot of IT companies which do that kind of work, uh, and they are all competitors. Uh, if you see account aggregator and TSP, if you go to the Semati website, you will see about 30 different uh, TSPs, IT companies of all kinds, including a few of the big four in India, uh, are TSPs, uh, account aggregators, there are four licensed ones, uh, and PSCRA, there are three licensed entities. So depending upon which market segment you're looking at, uh, the, the answer changes, but if you are restricting yourself to the core, which is head-to-head, uh, -head, is there uh, one or two or three RTA competitors? There's only one. Okay, sir. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll take our next question from the line of Kaushik Agarwal from Haitong Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Kaushik, this side. I hope I am audible. You are, Kaushik. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity and congratulations, sir, for the quarter. Sir, I have a few questions. So, number one is regarding this press release where you mentioned that CAMS FinServe has collaborated with Microsoft India to develop the AA marketplace. So, I just wanted to understand what kind of collaboration is this and uh, is there any sort of investments which we are going to do in the near future in terms of the, uh, in terms of money or in terms of the manpower for this specific collaboration? Number one. Number two is a data keeping point. I just wanted to know the ESOP number for uh, Q4 FY22 and Q4 FY21 and for full year FY22. For sure. Uh, well, very good question. So uh, just as you know, uh, our business is, uh, is kind of moving away almost to be a predominantly technology-oriented business uh, and a platform business. Uh, within that, account aggregator is a new initiative, and we wanted to be sure that we were, we had best-in-class partnerships in the country uh, with entities which were not just commercially partnering, partnering with us. I mean, I can go and buy something from Microsoft, and <clears throat> I can call it a partnership, but that, that is not uh, how this is built. 
Microsoft as an India centric initiative has partnered with the market leaders specific market leaders in different segments so let's say <clears throat> someone in banking someone in insurance someone in account aggregator etc uh, with the explicit uh, i would say objective of deepening and broadening the market making specific innovations relevant to that market uh, helping enhance the product this is their tech capabilities and then helping with the go to market selling will continue remaining our responsibility but because of their wide breadth and wide reach uh, they will certainly evangelize the product class and evangelize can this is not a financial jv it is not a financial jv it's not a financial partnership uh, it is not that we are each putting in money to create something it's not a foundation not a chair it's a stated partnership between two corporates which goes beyond i would say the <coughs> stated commercial agenda or oh, one being a seller and the other being a buyer uh, it is in microsoft's interest to do foundational work in the country uh, think of it as foundational market making work that they're doing jointly with camps in the area of account aggregator so i'll take the question question on esop uh, so for the year uh, the the cost to pnl that we have taken uh, when you see a salary cost of 321 crores that includes uh, 25.3 crores cost uh, because of uh, esop which is a non cash charge um, uh, that answers one part of your question for the quarter our uh, cost accounted is around 7.5 crores uh, which was probably around 4.8 crores more than what it was in the same quarter last year okay okay so just last question on the margin side uh, we have seen like on q on q basis or due to obvious reason that you mentioned during the initial remarks that there was some investment being made due to which the ebitda margin has seen uh, 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 like from 45 to about 43.6% during the quarter what's your uh, what's your 2 to 3 years view on the on the margin trajectory for the company so uh, our commentary has been consistent on that uh, what we have been saying is that uh, the the normal margin and because of uh, various reasons including from a uh, yield depletion because of growth in volume to salary increase to our investments that we do in a new business as well as in information security and talent our long term view of the margin has been in a good year it will be a uh, little more than 40% uh, and in a year where assets don't grow it will be uh, probably between 35 and 40 Uh, we don't see any reason to revise that uh, guidance as of now uh, in terms of where we think the margins will settle at uh, we'll have to wait and see regarding the asset growth over the remaining period of the year and then we'll probably have to revise uh, any commentary we have on that okay okay thank you so much sir that's it from my side thank you and next question is from the line of chatan jadhav from sarsar capital please go ahead hello uh, greetings am i audible yes you are Uh, greeting gentlemen and first of all congratulations on good set of numbers actually my question is just a follow up uh, regarding the margins itself i just wanted to know if you all are planning to uh, planning on margin expansion what steps uh, can be taken in order to improve pat and ebit margins um so uh, from a margin perspective the historically if you see uh, uh, what has been the margins has been within the range of 35 to 40% uh, in a good year it has been around 40% uh, over the last uh, one year definitely you have seen some margin expansion happening it's been a combination of the growth in the assets as well as uh, some amount of cost optimization that has happened the automation that's happened has kind of benefited to an extent on the cost but going forward from a margin perspective uh, i think our expectation is that uh, to maintain a 40, early 40s kind of a margin uh, will will involve a lot of work from my side it's it's not we're not looking at a huge margin expansion for reasons that are uh, well documented number one you know this volume based pricing or the the slab based pricing will ensure that going forward yield will keep falling down as the assets grow and that needs to be managed uh, this is something that we enter into a relationship with our customers on a win win basis so that's something that is not reversible and the, you know that india is a wage inflationary country right so if you kind of have to be in the market you have to give them decent wage high so on a year on year basis you are going to get this 10 15% increase in salary cost uh, and then the investments that we need to make to in, maintain our salience in terms of information technology services the huge capex that we are incurring uh you know last year was in fact the highest year in terms of camps we we spent some 65 crores only on it assets and capex just to ensure that we are geared up for the transaction volume as well as statutory requirements 
So these things will keep happening, and the scope that uh, that the RTS will need to do uh, for the same fee will keep creeping up. That's the nature of the business. Nature of the business. Any regulatory changes have come, we'll have to invest on that. We'll have to invest on the IT infrastructure. So our overall view is that we will continue to doing all these things, continue to kind of handle price reductions, continue to handle wage inflations, and continue to uh, invest in business and new business. And if we kind of retain the same margins level going forward, the early 40s, I think this is kind of we have done well. That's been our outlook. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, that was it. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Prashil Shah from Capgrow Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, my question is regarding um, so uh, regarding the competition. So, as you rightly mentioned, uh, there are only two players in this market. So, how do we differentiate ourselves from the custom uh, from your competitor, which would be K FinTech? So, uh, you can see that. Um the MF market, the MFRTA market is now almost uh, close to 30-year-old market. Uh, within this marketplace, as I explained earlier, uh, consumers and uh, asset managers are looking for a set of traits, a set of capabilities, uh, and are wanting to make a decision based on that. Uh, the business has become extremely regulated. Uh, the market expectation is 100% quality. Uh, small things that go wrong catch the attention of not just consumers, but uh, governing bodies, auditors, boards, trustees, all of them. Uh, gold plating in, uh, in end results, in quality, in complaints, in investor servicing, in record keeping, in the way we manage APIs, the way we manage uptime of uh, our ID assets, uh, the speed at which uh, we process things. The capability of the team, uh, the vintage of the team, uh, capability of the digital assets, investors who prefer getting service digitally on our assets, spread of the front offices. Like I said, are various criteria that uh, asset managers would deploy. Of course, they would also look at commercials and price, etc. Over the last 30 years, while both companies have been in the arena, you can look at the clientele, uh, you can look at the head of the market, you can see, uh, you know, the, the winning track record of large, uh, significant logos, large brands, etc. And make up your own mind, and of course, you're in touch with the marketplace, so I'm sure you're speaking to our clients, etc. Uh, differentiation doesn't get created in a day. Differentiation doesn't get created in PowerPoints. Differentiation will not happen because of something that I did yesterday or in the last three months. I think it is just sustained investment, sustained capability, demonstrated results, exceeding expectations across all these metrics that I spoke about, which have brought us where we are. So that's really the answer to the question. I, I do not want to say that it is some technology edge or it is some people edge or it is some digital edge. I think it's a culmination of all of these factors built over decades. The trust that CAPS has built as a significant center of the arena market participant, which has brought us where we are. That's really how I would answer your question. Okay. And uh, just some months back, maybe little more than a year, uh, Kotak had sort of invested in case intact. So what do you make of that investment? Is there any threat of them over a period of maybe two or three years down the line sort of moving to K, K FinTech as their RTA, do you see that as a threat? No, we don't see that as a threat. Uh, our understanding is that the Kota Group continues to make strategic investments in entities across the marketplace. Uh, this is one of those investments. Is it uh, tightly coupled or tightly tied uh, to a decision to buy RTA services from one entity to the other, uh, between this entity and the other? Uh, we do not see that connection. We have not sent anything. And uh, and acquiring Zeruda as a um, as a client. So after, so can you just walk us through the journey of of, of how how acquiring a new client and goes? When do you sort of start um, earning from from this partnership? So uh, typically, 
when an application for an amc is made that that becomes visible it's a small market so we know who all are participating in the marketplace so a lot of times the potential consumers do reach out to us or we reach out to them depending upon who makes the phone call first uh, the process is uh, it takes time because uh, the the <coughs> newly registered amc is in the run up to getting the license are supposed to demonstrate that they have capabilities of fund management capabilities of investor servicing and that they are beginning to identify partnerships uh, for all of this they obviously also supposed to have other partnerships uh, in the area of uh, fund administration in the area of custody etc uh, so they begin to start the process much before the license comes in <coughs> and sometimes coinciding with the license Uh, they are able to culminate the process in a point all of them uh revenue only starts post launch typically everyone will start with a scheme uh, most of them will start with an equity scheme there are track records where amcs have started with a debt or a liquid scheme too so the first scheme has to come out which comes out as an nfo and that is when you start getting the first assets and the first transaction to build the whole process as a long i mean on an average will take about a year at least but can sometimes take even longer yeah just one last question so what i meant was when does it start adding value um, in term not just the, in terms of revenue but also in terms of profitability okay so uh, think of it this way i'll just give you a metric and then uh, then you can make your own decision i'm not giving you a specific accounting answer uh for any new amc to be relevant for themselves and you know for suppliers like us to make money there has to be a critical mass and think of that critical mass as being at least 10000 crores of aum uh because before that those are really small numbers uh at which business is still kind of uh, suboptimal in size for them and because it is for them obviously for the other participants too it is not yet cross the critical threshold so it takes that uh, minimum threshold for it to become profitable uh, in the range of let's say 8 to 10000 crore that typically takes time uh, it will not happen in the first year but it can happen let's say between the second and third year if uh, if the sales setup is strong uh, amcs could get to that level those are the levels let's say between 5 and 10000 crore that the assets begin to make sense commercial sir okay thank you Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was the last question. I now hand the floor back to Mr. Ram Charan for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for attending the earnings call of CAMS. Uh, please feel free to reach out for any further questions uh, to either Orion Capital or IR or to Anish Savlani in the email addresses given in our corporate presentation or in the communication that you have received. Look forward to your continued coverage and support. Uh, thanks again for attending. Thank you members of the management. Ladies and gentlemen on behalf of Computer Age Management Services Limited that concludes the